Good morning to these people on the webinar. Are you there? Oh, you can't speak. Sorry. I'll just, I'll just assume you are. Um, so welcome. It's January 21st, and we are live um, at the League of Minnesota Cities in downtown St. Paul, where it's uh, hazy again. Um, and um, we're really excited to be here for um, our workshop, our Green Set City Work Monthly Workshop. Um, we have an incredible group of speakers and discussions that are going to have to say, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm Diana. I'm Diana McEwen and I am um, with the Great Plains Institute, and I direct the Metro Region of CERT, the Clean Energy Resource Team, um, at the Great Plains, and both Great Plains Institute and CERT are partners of the Green Set Cities program, so we're like partnerships, we're like a partner, um, it's really confusing. Um, but we're happy to be here and be part of this program. Um, I um, will turn over the meeting as shortly here to Ann Gallant from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Thank you so much for all your work putting this together. Um, she is the water expert. I am not. Um, and um, I do want to thank um, so the Pollution Control Agency for being the host partner for today's workshop. And we have two awesome co-sponsors. Solution Blue and um, Stark Rainwater Harvesting. They have materials and information in the back. Um, when we do the follow-up, we include links to their website with information for folks that they want to, you know, need that. Um, you know, we'll be live tweeting today again, so don't forget, folks. It is hashtag GreenStepWKSHP. That stands for workshop. So it's hashtag GreenStepWKSHP. You can follow our live tweeting because it's going to be a juicy topic. Um, I like to, um, we usually go around and do introductions. I think it's really helpful to know who, which cities and who is um, on the phone and in the room. Um, and when you say, say your name and your affiliation, like what city you're with or you're with here with a company, um, and if you're a green step city or not, um, that's really helpful too. We like to, we like to have that um, as the introduction. So is there a way to do this? Should we do this? Can we do the phone? Uh, or can we not do the phone? You'll read the phone. Okay. So if you have a question, raise your hand and then speak into one of the little mics. If there's a near one, or we'll bring one to you. They have a little black button. Don't touch that. <laughs> um, and so presenters, too, you'll have one. Please speak into it so that your voice is projected through the room so people on the phone can hear you. Awesome. So that is Patrick. The great Mathway. He is a Minnesota Green Corps member serving with Great Plains this year, and he has been instrumental in making these workshops go, especially the technology. I might be a social media guru, but don't have me in charge of webinars. Um, so why don't we go around the room? I think I kind of just introduced, introduced you, but you know, you can introduce yourself if you like, Patrick. Um, yeah, Patrick Mathway, Minnesota Green Corps member with the Great Plains Institute. Um, yeah, helping out with the webinars and the workshop. Uh, Philip Music, I co-direct the Green Step Cities program at the NBCA. Mitchell Kukis with Solution Blue. We work with uh, Stark and West in the city and a bunch of people at the Lower Town Ballpark. CHS Field, I should say. Well, I think is, that, is that what it's called? Yeah, it's CHS Field now. We can't call it the ballpark anymore. We can't. But Johnny, uh, I'm the president of Solution Blue and I was the project manager for the uh, sustainable stormwater systems at the CHS field. I'm Wes Saunders Pierce, and I'm with the city of St. Paul. Don't hold the button. Thank you. I'm Wes Saunders Pierce. I'm with the city of St. Paul, and I'm the water resource coordinator there, and we are in the process of becoming a green step city. I'll be talking about the rainwater harvesting um, at the CHS field. Sharon is the uh, environmental resources coordinator with the city of Laguerre, and we are a Green Step City. I'm Mike Eisenstein with the Middle St. Croix Watershed Management Organization, and I'm going to be talking about uh, working with uh, 13 communities uh, in Washington County on uh, Lake St. Croix uh, with adopting uh, middle and technicized standards. Uh, and we do not have any Green Step Cities in our watershed yet. I'm Dave Stark. I'm the owner of Stark Rainwater Harvesting. Uh, we've worked on uh, rainwater harvesting projects around Minnesota and other states, uh, involved with uh, code 
and regulations and looking forward to talking about it today. Good morning, I'm Peter Lindstrom and I'm the Local Government Outreach Coordinator for the Clean Energy Resource Teams and also the Mayor of Falcon Heights. Which is a green set city. Which is a green set city. <laughs> yeah. I'm Sandra McHugh, and I work with St. Paul Public Schools in the Facilities Department. Stay quality environmental planner, city of Fridley, New Green Step City. Ross Bender, city of Edina, we are Green Step City. Uh, I'm Danielle Cabot, I'm from the League of Minnesota City. Very good. With the uh, Alliance for Sustainability and the City of St. Louis Park Environment Sustainability Commission. Great, thank you. And then I'm going to hand it over um, and let um, Anne introduce herself and then um, kick it off with the speaker. Okay, well, right. I'm introduce people on the phone. Oh, Patrick. it's Patrick. Yeah, that's right. So I'll let Patrick do that then on me. Who's on the phone? On the phone, we have Amber Brooks Moore, Moeller um, from Power Lake, Green Corps member. Um, Anita Rasmussen from Sartell. Dan Murphy, Gary Kelkar, Anna Beeler uh, from Marshall, also a uh, Green Corps member, uh, Kari Andrus, Molly Eden, Pete Young from Prior Lake, Sarah Alexander, and Thea Holmberg Johnson. Thank you. I'm going to um, introduce Ann Galvin from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. She helped put together this incredible agenda um, and the speakers, and so give her all the credit for the program. Um, thank you, Ann. All right. Uh, thank you for um, allowing us to be at this workshop. I think I'm really excited about it. We're going to be covering a lot of topics, um, both on the minimal impact design standards and some incredible stormwater reuse projects. So um, I want to start with um, all right. So Minnesota Green Step Cities. I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the, the stormwater pieces that we have here. I can get this to work. Okay. So Innovative story more of the details about what that is. The fifth practice down here is adopt and implement the guidelines for so on, so on. And then we have four different practices there, rain gardens, green roofs, green walls, cisterns, and other stormwater reuse strategies, green alleys, green parking lots, and pervious pavement um, or pavers. So we have three speakers who are going to be talking about the cisterns and other stormwater reuse strategies. So what is MID? I know some of you know this. Um, so we have the guidance. This will take you through all this development for redevelopment and for linear projects. And this is a, a picture of the stakeholders um, after some legislation was passed in 2009. And this diverse group of stakeholders, some of you are in the room, some of you are on the webinar, um, really helped guide the PCA in the development of MIS. Basically, the stakeholder group did all the work, presented it to the MPCA, and we adopted it. So we hired consultants to do a lot of this work for us. Um, this is all science-based. Uh, we hired um, mainly Bar Engineering did a lot of the work for us. We had a couple other consultants involved as locations. So if you're interested in learning more about you know, how the performance goals were developed and things like that, everything came out of MID has been a water manual. Um, this is a really exciting tool that we developed to buy see some half phases out there. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an awesome tool because it's a wiki, um, which means that 
uh, staff at the MP MPCA don't have to go through our long process to get something posted online. <laughs> and actually, Phil, you can help us with this because the Green Step Cities is similar in that Phil can just go and make changes on the fly as well. So it makes updating a lot easier. We used to have this big, you know, three-ring binder and we go through some revisions every so often and it was difficult because you had to change all, you know, everything. So this is like current, up-to-date, the most recent information available for stormwater. So if you go, um, there's a whole section that kind of gives some background information on the legislation. To meet the 1.1 inch performance goal, it's full, um, you would use the flow chart to arrive at, at a, a different performance goal, and I think Mike's going to go into more detail on that. This community assistance package, um, this is the ordinance package, and this is what, it, what the front cover looks like, um, a long form a medium form, and a short form for communities. We also developed a calculator. Um, this is Minnesota's awesome, awesome tool. It's being modified. By, um, but what it does is you put your design into the calculator, and in the end, it will calculate the total volume, total phosphorus, and total suspended solids that will be uh, removed from the site that you're developing. So it's a, a very great tool. If you're interested in learning how to use a calculator, if you don't already know, um, there's going to be a training at the Minnesota Erosion Control Association in March um, in Duluth. And Mike Eisensee and Jay Riggs will be doing that training. So I want to go back to Green Step and just show you. So staff to train or Nemo or their information into the green set. They had, they did a, a training, a calculator or something, and they did an intro. And then I noticed St. Paul just entered some information uh, last month that they're going to be adopting and implementing this in 2015. 2015. So that's all I have. Um, I'd like to introduce, yeah, Harry. Yeah, I was just, can you just share why you think that is? Like I'm concerned about us in St. Louis Park and so when, when, what kinds of conversations have you had about why we aren't doing it? I'm just curious. So the question is why aren't more people registering as um, getting their stars yeah. for using this? I'm not sure. I think it might just be a lack of awareness. Um, I was just talking to Mike Eisenstein before, and he wasn't aware that this was the case. I wasn't aware, so. Yeah. So I think it's just we need to do more promotion. I'm probably going to be contacting some cities directly um, that I know that are. Okay. <laughs> and you're with? St. Louis Park. St. Louis Park. Okay. And I know Falcon Heights. Come on, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I, I know there's more. I mean, <laughs> And I don't want to steal Mike's thunder because he's going to talk about some of the communities that have adopted this. But for example, Valley Branch Watershed District was the first watershed district to adopt this. So all those communities in that watershed district are under those rules now. So all they have to do is change their ordinances either by reference or do an ordinance revision, and then they get three stars. So. We'll be we'll be adding to this for sure. Any other questions before I introduce Mike? All right, Mike, come on up. Um, Mike is the administrator of the Middle St. Croix Watershed District. He the Middle St. Croix is comprised of ten communities along the federally administered Wild and Scenic St. Croix River. Mike supports watershed planning, uh, best management practice design water quality protection and restoration in Washington County. And Mike was also very instrumental um, in the MIDS work of MIDS. I work for the Middle St. Croix Watershed Management Organization. Uh, the Watershed Management Organization is comprised of 10 communities along the St. Croix River uh, that extension of those 10 local units of government. Uh, 
primarily focused on uh, helping everybody collaboratively uh, manage, uh, protect, and restore water resources within the watershed. Um, now, currently, the Middle St. Croix Watershed Management Organization is undertaking the uh, updating of their watershed management plan. This occurs every 10 years, so we're on our third generation of the watershed management plan. And as part of this process, we have a stakeholder involvement uh, component. Uh, during the stakeholder involvement component, uh, one of the pieces that came up over and over in conversations was that uh, our current standards, uh, which are which is a, uh, basically for water quality treatment as a half inch of volume off new or redeveloped impervious surface, uh, plus a quarter inch uh, volume control for compacted uh, soil, was um, not consistent uh, with any other other watersheds or cities uh, in the area or actually in the state. Uh, and, and that was a uh, that was a concern uh, that the watershed management uh, organization's <coughs> performance standards uh, were uh, not flexible. So really, we had the we had the performance standards that we really outside of the variance process for the communities. We really didn't have flexibility in the standards, and that they were difficult to follow. As a matter of fact, uh, during many of the conversations, the minimal impact design standards came up. Uh, typically, uh, typically because uh, the, the members of uh, the stakeholders group had heard about NIS uh, and had some introductory information uh, through non-point education for municipal officials that they were doing uh, work in the watershed. So it was pretty, uh, it was pretty obvious really uh, early on in the, in the update process that we would be adopting NIS. But one of the conversations that, that came up uh, from uh, the 10 uh, board members for the WMO, which are all locally elected officials from their communities, uh, was about the effectiveness of the approach of simply uh, referencing the watershed management organization standards uh, as a local unit of government. And so that's typically the way uh, local units of government adopt standards from watershed management organizations or watershed districts. Um, uh, there are advantages to doing that for the uh, local communities, such as if the watershed uh, changes the standards, uh, then it's easy uh, they don't have to go and open the ordinances back up and modify the ordinances. Uh, there are many disadvantages to that uh, approach as well. And the, the big one is it can create a lot of confusion for developers. Uh, they're looking at developing in the community because they look at the subdivision ordinances and the stormwater uh, requirements for the city and their preliminary plat design is usually based on that. And then they, uh, then they look at the watershed districts or the watershed management organizations uh, and performance standards. And so it, it, we found that it's uh, been creating a lot of iterative design. So the, the community, you know, the, the, the representatives of the community asked the question, well, uh, what would, uh, what, how could we uh, help communities actually adopt NIS into local ordinances? Uh, and there were many advantages to doing that. Uh, so the, the first one would be a, the middle St. Croix, now that we've come to a base standard, uh, is uh, confident that a 1.1 inch uh, is probably going to be the new standard that we're going to stay with, so it's more stable. Um, and when we're going through ordinances and we're, we're adopting this through the stormwater ordinance, we're also going to have the opportunity to look at the subdivision ordinance and ask the question, are there conflicts in subdivision ordinance uh, that actually cost, uh, cost quite a bit of time and dollars for developers in the community uh, to work through that we can address when we're going through that revision process. Uh, the challenge, of course, for doing that is that updating ordinances is a time-intensive uh, activity because there are a lot of stakeholders involved. And uh, specifically when you're talking about stormwater ordinance updates, uh, crossing over with subdivision ordinance updates, you have a couple different uh, areas of expertise that you want involved in that process as well as uh, an education process, making sure that uh, the, uh, the right decisions are being made and that the decisions are informed. So um, in order to get, to get through that piece, we uh, had applied for a accelerated implementation grant from the Board of Water and Soil Resources uh, to work with up to 13 communities, uh, 10 communities in the Middle St. Croix, and then three other communities within the Lake St. Croix watershed. Uh, yes? I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I, I thought you would answer this. Sure. Name the 10 communities because I don't know what they are. Oh, okay. sure. Yeah, that's a good point. But, uh, <laughs> be helpful. Yeah, the, the 10 communities that, if, that are part of the Middle St. Croix uh, WMO actually, uh, I don't know if I can get them all. I'll, I'll try. Uh, but basically, uh, you, if you think about Lake St. Croix on the east side of the metro, it's, we, we start up in Stillwater, right? And then uh, we go all the 
all the way down to the north side of Afton along along the river. So that's Stillwater, Oak Park Heights, uh, Bayport, uh, then uh, West Lakeland Township, Baytown Township, uh, Afton, who did I miss in there? Lakeland, thank you. Oh boy. Lakeland. I hope none of my board members are listening to this webcast. I see a lot of trouble. Take various points as one. And then we have uh, then we have some uh, some other communities. Uh, we're um, uh, talking to Forest Lake. Uh, it's, uh, it's, we're currently talking to staff at Lake Elmo. Uh, and we're currently talking to uh, Washington County at the very preliminary level of uh, potentially participating in this program and don't really have commitment to that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, um, uh, so the, the accelerated implementation grant looked at working with 13 communities, and uh, and the, the the goal is basically to provide assistance uh, to the communities for adopting this as a local ordinance. Uh, we were successful in, in, in got the grant, and we put together a technical team uh, that consists of uh, folks who had worked on uh, the initial pilot project to develop the NIS Community Assistance Package. Uh, NIS Community Assistance Package is that ordinance package that Dan said that uh, Ann had referenced earlier, uh, and um, and this was this is the process that we've established and, and we're moving forward with, and we actually are at different stages. Uh, with all uh, with the 13 communities uh, in this process, but I kind of wanted to take a look at some of the high kind of the high points of this uh, of this process. So the first piece uh, initial meeting for city staff for local officials. We have about five communities that we're at this point at right now, where we're basically just sitting down, having a conversation, uh, and covering the three key points uh, that we that we cover over and over again with all of our groups. Uh, always start with stormwater 101 is the first one. So what are the what, what's really the driver for this and and these uh, the, the changes in our water quality uh, standards? Uh, explaining what this is and how it's different from what we currently have, and then also outlining the benefits uh, to the communities because they're actually in the middle of St. Croix specifically. There are uh, there are a number of uh, benefits for adopting this. Uh, primarily focused with focused on flexibility and consistency uh, that will make it easier for uh, developers and develop, development and redevelopment, uh, but at the same time, uh, is a better standard for uh, protecting water resources. So another piece of the process, uh, the, the after after we have the initial meeting and we provide the invitation letters to the cities, is requesting them uh, to send their city attorney uh, to an attorney uh, workshop uh, that was uh, that was developed as part of this project. What we found in the initial pilot program when we were developing the, the this community assistance package was that in all three communities, uh, we got through a year-long process of updating the ordinances, and then the last person to actually even be aware that this process was going on was the city attorney. Uh, so then the city attorney had this whole uh, list, uh, list of modifications and stormwater ordinances and some of the subdivision ordinances. Uh, that were put on their desk for legal review, and they didn't really, they didn't know what this was. They didn't know what the legal underpinnings of this uh, of this were, and they had a number of um, a number of questions that really held up the process for adoption. So we decided uh, this time uh, to take that one on early. Uh, so we did get all of the get all of the attorneys uh, from our communities, which is actually in our area. There's a lot of overlap, so it wasn't really that many communities. There were only uh, six. Uh, to attend a, an overview of the Mid Community Assistance Package and went through that package in detail. Uh, and the big piece was uh, we were really looking for concerns up front uh, because we could address those then during the during the, uh, the ordinance modification process. So I just want to take a quick run through and how the big package. So this is, these are the model ordinances. Basically, the Mid Community Assistance Package is broken into three different sets of ordinances. Uh, based on the capacity of, of, the, of your community or what you're looking for for ordinances. Pages 14 through 16, two pages, is really the basis for MIT. That's that performance standard, the calculator, and the flexible treatment option. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically designed for communities that already have erosion and sediment control uh, components and have uh, enforcement and inspections uh, component, uh, components already in, in their local ordinance. 
The next set, uh, Morgan, so 17 to 21, basically builds on that mini version, and this is the median mic. So if you are in a community that doesn't have really any stormwater erosion control ordinances, this is a, a, a pretty easy uh, template to move into your community that uh, ties you uh, back to the construction stormwater permit, uh, integrates any watershed or WMO requirements, um, and uh, has processes involved for the application review and enforcement of permits. Then the final one, uh, pages uh, 22 to 108, uh, this, is a, uh, this is really uh, that, uh, that medium uh, format uh, with a whole bunch of additions uh, and really goes more into depth uh, the, uh, the reasoning uh, behind each of the ordinances and expands on them uh, with uh, quite a bit of detail. Okay, so that, uh, so, so basically, uh, where we're at with most of our communities right now is we've done that initial meeting. We sent the letter. Uh, the, we had the attorneys come to, uh, come to the initial training, um, uh, and uh, we're working with currently working with planning commission and, and uh, council to go through these three items. And uh, this is kind of the foundation uh, for us to begin the ordinance process. And it's such an important piece. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to share. Uh, an overview of this information that we, we provide fairly uh, consistently uh, so that you're, you're kind of more familiar with this yourself. So basically, starting with that stormwater 101 piece, uh, our, our real challenge is that land use is linked to water quality, right? The old Nemo mantra for non-point education for municipal officials. Uh, as we increase impervious surface on our landscape, uh, we decrease uh, deep and shallow water recharge, and we are increasing the volume of runoff coming off of our landscape. Um, we can see that uh, in Washington County in a, in a lot of different areas. So this, uh, like the, the wild wings of Onika uh, are, uh, are really our, what our pre-development hydrology snapshot looks like. The Marine Lake is a really low density uh, uh, development. Then when we get into Colby Lake and Woodbury, we're seeing more uh, uh, median residential development. If we go back and we look, we're usually somewhere in the ballpark of about 30% uh, of the water uh, running off there instead of 10% uh, in, in our natural condition. And then uh, in our commercial industrial developments, we really see those higher impervious numbers in Washington County. But it's not just a problem of volume uh, that, that that's our challenge. Uh, along with that volume comes a lot of pollutants. Uh, the technical terminology for the stuff in the curb line is gunk. Uh, what gunk consists of is sediment, uh, heavy metals, trace petroleum products, right, nitrogen, and then the big one that we're always working on in Minnesota, phosphorus. Uh, and so uh, the reason phosphorus has become such a big issue in Minnesota is it has a direct impact on our recreational use of our waters, uh, specifically in the, uh, in the way of uh, algae production. It makes it hard to swim in the water uh, with a lot of uh, algae, and that one pound of phosphorus equates to about 500 pounds of algae in, in most lakes and water bodies. The study actually at the University of Minnesota that was done in the, the mid-80s found the range was somewhere between 500 to 1,100 pounds, uh, depending on the system, uh, that you had the phosphorus. Uh, so the 500 is a fairly conservative estimate. Um, and we're, we're actually seeing the impacts of this. This is Lake St. Croix in uh, 2013, uh, and um, uh, we, we can actually see the impact of the fact that our old stormwater technology isn't working. We really have to change what we're, we're doing if we're going to have uh, uh, development uh, adjacent to the waters that we want to recreate in. Uh, and so one of the big pieces that, that we do know, though, uh, which is a benefit, is that if you look at Minnesota, you start out in the northwest corner of the state, a half-inch storm event is about 75% of our annual pollutant load. And then as you as you move across the state and you get into down into the southwest Minnesota, 1.5 inches of rainfall is about 75% of the pollutant load. And this is because uh, what, what happens uh, in those small storm events is uh, the, the water that's hitting those impervious surfaces is basically flushing it clean, right? That's called the first flush phenomenon. So really our new strategy is just looking at controlling the quality uh, and if, when possible, uh, the volume of these small storm events uh, between half inch to 1.5 inches. So the, the way we've traditionally been working with stormwater uh, since uh, the 1950s and 1960s has really been a uh, strategy of centralizing 
uh, is centralizing stormwater through conveyances. So we've got a very efficient conveyance system, centralized storage, uh, and uh, and then uh, once uh, once we exceed the capacity of our storage, we meter it out, right? We let the water, uh, all the volume is still there. We're just letting it out more slowly over time. Uh, but along with that, uh, we've been uh, we had implemented wet ponds around the, met the metropolitan area, around actually the, the United States. And wet ponds are really effective at capturing some of those sediments, uh, but not so effective at capturing uh, some of the soluble stuff, such as uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, that are impacting our water resources. So starting in about the early 1990s, we really started looking at uh, infiltration as one of the possible ways to manage these small storm events, uh, but also uh, harvesting uh, and evapotranspirating that water. Evapotranspiration is basically uptaking and sweating that water out through plants. Um, and this is a study from the, uh, the National uh, Academies of Science uh, that said that this is actually an issue nationwide uh, and that all, all, in order to protect our surface waters uh, or restore them in many cases where we've had urban development, uh, where we really need to uh, change our strategy and start treating these small storm events. So in, the, in Minnesota, again, that's a half inch to 1.5 inch, represents 75% of that load. Uh, and then they also showed that uh, monitoring shows uh, over and over again uh, that our past practices are not doing the job. So we have to, we're going to have to change. So with this information and, and a lot of other science, uh, in 2009, uh, the legislature uh, requested the MTCA or required uh, them to develop performance standards, design standards, and other tools to promote the use of low impact development. Uh, the, the, in, in general, low impact development, the concept is treat the small storm, uh, treat that raindrop where it falls, right? So let's get away from conveying our small storms, but instead let's find uh, places to infiltrate, uh, harvest, evapotranspirate, or filtrate that water uh, closer to its source, uh, and then for the small storms, and then convey the large storms uh, safely for flood control. Um, so my definition of this, uh, which is a little bit different than the PCAs, uh, but I think it's still very accurate, it's consistent, it's flexible, and it's achievable stormwater management. Um, and the emphasis is really keeping, uh, keeping that raindrop uh, where it falls and uh, preserving uh, to preserve natural resources. And again, uh, we're looking at the small storm event. So uh, Anne went over these uh, four basic components of this, so I won't review those again. And she also talked about the stakeholder process, which is what I think makes this uh, uh, fairly unique. It actually took about three years, uh, and uh, this is the small list of uh, organizations that were involved in the development of the minimal impact design standards. Um, but the, the outcome has been, uh, has been well received, and uh, we actually see this being uh, adopted across the metro. Uh, so in reference here, uh, Middle St. Croix is on the right side of the screen right along the St. Croix River. And all of the watershed uh, districts or the watershed areas highlighted in orange are the uh, uh, watershed districts that are currently going through their plan update process. It just happens to be a coincidence that there's a straight line right across the metro uh, and are uh, either, either in the process of adopting or have adopted uh, NIDS into uh, in, into their uh, into their watershed plan, and then uh, there's also a list of a, a large number of cities, and, and that list is growing just as fast uh, for cities that are uh, that are adopting. And, um, and just a, just another note: so Browns Creek just started their watershed uh, plan update uh, recently, and so they're, they're starting to take a look at this right now. Uh, the Vermilion River uh, Joint Powers Organization down in Dakota County. Uh, it also has it on uh, on their punch list to look at uh, later this year as a potential. So we, um, uh, so the, so actually I'm going to hop to this one first. So why are stakeholders important? And it kind of goes back to uh, again, it's con uh, consistent. It's easier to uh, to implement at the local level if it's consistent because developers come to town who have been uh, who have designed developments under this at different locations. When they come to your city, uh, they already uh, they already know what the standard is, uh, and they already have a list of practices that worked well in a previous development uh, and receive the same credit that you're giving uh, for those same practices in your community. Uh, and if they're more flexible, so if there is high surficial groundwater, if the site does con contain contaminated soil, uh, there's, a, there's a clear path 
uh, to reducing the standards to actually fit, uh, fit the, the restraints of the site. Uh, the, uh, again, uh, how, so, so that when it, a lot of the communities in Middle St. Croix ask, well, how are they different than our uh, existing requirements? And it's the, the same answer, right? Are you guys sensing a trend here? Uh, consistent, they're more consistent, they're more flexible, uh, and uh, that makes them more achievable uh, on our developments. And our, our real goal is to reduce iterations of, of design uh, for stormwater. One or two is fine, uh, but um, a lot of developments go through many more uh, because, they're, because we're lacking clarity. So now I'm going to get into the details. What exactly are myths and the numbers? So first is that stormwater volume uh, performance standard. For 90% of the projects that we're going to see, uh, the, the requirement uh, for uh, stormwater volume control is going to be 1.1 inch off uh, new or fully reconstructed services. Or if it's a linear project, it's going to be 0.55 inches off of those uh, impervious services. Um, now there's 10% of the sites that we're going to see are going to have, uh, in the middle of St. Croix, are going to have uh, one of those six restrictions. And so uh, for those sites, then, uh, basically we start with the 1.1, but it's pretty obvious right away that we're not going to be, achieve, be able to achieve that. Uh, and so the standard then, then it drops, and really what we're looking for is half that volume. Can we get it on site and achieve 75 percent total phosphorus load reduction? So that the goal isn't just to eliminate uh, infiltration altogether. Uh, maybe the contaminated soils are located in the northeast quadrant of the site. Uh, we can still get some volume control on the western side uh, of the site, uh, but we uh, but, uh, just by the metrics of the site and design, uh, we're going to have to filter some of that. Uh, so the combination between infiltration and filtration is 75%. Um, so then, uh, let's say, for example, we have contamin uh, contaminated soils throughout the full site, and we can't do any volume control on the site. Uh, then the um, uh, and, and that includes the consideration of looking at harvesting and reuse. Uh, and if that's not, if that's not achievable, uh, then uh, really what we're looking for is to remove 60% of the annual total phosphorus load. And then we have areas in the middle of St. Croix, like downtown Stillwater, uh, that uh, have a lot of those restrictions, uh, contaminated soils, high surface groundwater, uh, in the floodplain, um, high density impervious surface with no green space, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, so in some cases, we, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, the communities will be looking at off-site mitigation. So can we do credit, move the practice within the same watershed, uh, to the same receiving uh, receiving water, uh, but um, uh, because they get get the volume reduction uh, where it's more uh, cost effective. Just a question about downtown Stillwater. There, there's going to be a lot of new opportunities with Highway 95 being repaved by the county and or by the state, and uh, they're looking at a bike to pedestrian upgrade for downtown. Um, are you guys helping them to proactively? Kind of like take advantage of these street reconstruction opportunities to to go for this, these type of things. Yeah. So the the question was on uh, Highway 95 and Cooperstown Town Stillwater area. There's a lot of construction uh, currently occurring as well as being planned into the future. Uh, and are we working with them uh, to address the stormwater volumes on those sites? Uh, the answer is yes. And actually, uh, the, the the structure of the watershed management organization is. The, the city is doing is, is directly working with uh, both the county uh, and MnDOT uh, through their contracts and agreements. Uh, but the, the and then the Middle St. Croix WMO uh, does the technical review. We're usually involved at the pre-design concept phase and kind of talk about some of the goals that we think that could be achieved. Uh, then they go through the design process, and then uh, prior to city approval, then the uh, then we do a technical review. Uh, and submit our comments, which the city has the enforcement mechanism, they typically enforce through that process. So uh, redevelopment, uh, yes, volume control is, is covered in the middle of St. Croix through uh, our current system, and when we adopt it, it'll be covered uh, through this as well. But it will be more flexible. Oh, so the, the next piece is the credit calculator. <clears throat> this is the, the front page of the uh, the credit calculator. Basically, what this is is that uh, it's P8, a model, which is a water quality model, but it's got a user-friendly interface. 
Uh, so any, now all of a sudden, uh, anybody can be a P8 modeler, right? Uh, and that was kind of the goal of this. And so um, there is uh, what basically the way the calculator works is uh, you put in the, the metrics of your site, and it sets up a goal uh, for you to achieve based on the performance goal for mid. And then you have all of these practices uh, that, that are lined up that are available uh, for credits for that goal. And then uh, a lot of this work was done uh, during the initial development of it, and there wasn't really, we couldn't get all the BMPs in there that we wanted quite yet because the science wasn't quite there. So there is an other button uh, where uh, we, you can input load reduction uh, and volume reduction uh, uh, approved uh, credits for uh, stormwater irrigation and reuse, for example, uh, stormwater disconnect, which is really an important one, basically uh, removing curves and allowing uh, water to flow to green spaces to infiltrate uh, before it, it hits the central conveyance system, uh, or enhanced sand filters. Uh, so there's a lot of new technologies coming out up there that, uh, that you can use that section for. Uh, and then the, the, the real proof, though, is in the footing. And, and so we do run through uh, quite a few examples uh, for planning commission and uh, staff uh, of uh, projects that we reviewed and were approved in the past, and then we asked the question, well, how do they change? How does this change now if we adopt minimal impact design standards? So I just to take a quick look at one. This is a uh, 13 lot, 6.9 acre uh, subdivision uh, in the city of Oak Park Heights. Um, it's currently being constructed. It was uh, designed and approved at the beginning of 2014. Uh, under the curve requirements for the, the middle St. Croix, that half inch volume control and that uh, 0.25 inches uh, for uh, volume reduction, they were required to do 4,583 square feet of uh, bioretention, and then they needed rate control with a 3,600 square foot dry pond. Uh, and, um, uh, and so then I asked the question, well, you know, the new requirement would be 1.1 inches, which is quite a bit more. So, the, the simple way without redesigning the site uh, to, uh, to achieve that would be converting that, that dry detention basin into an infiltration basin simply by raising the outlet of it by a half foot. Basically, we just need to store a half foot of water in that basin and infiltrate it, and then we would be meeting the standard. If that wasn't feasible uh, because the high special groundwater, clays, et cetera, uh, then uh, the, the standard as design or the project as design would actually meet the flexible treatment options number one standard. Uh, and this is what that looks like when you input it into the uh, into the mid model. So there's the bioretention basin, uh, and then I just uh, uh, that that goes to what I'm not, what is the dry detention basin, and, and we put it as an infiltration basin, and then there's another small bioretention basin on the east side of the site. Uh, tree reconstruction. Uh, so, so here's an example project, City of Stillwater. This is the Pine Street reconstruction that occurred in 2013. Uh, the requirements uh, for this, uh, this area of reconstruction was uh, 4,600 cubic feet of uh, water that's retained and infiltrated. Uh, there were uh, nine curb cut by retention cells that were required for that. Um, the new requirement, 0.55 inches or mid, uh, is essentially the same. Uh, so we wouldn't, uh, this really doesn't impact our street reconstruction uh, from the way we're currently doing it in the middle of St. Croix. Uh, the advantages of, uh, the, the advantages that uh, were, uh, uh, that, that are that are present for adopting this into local ordinance uh, through the, the project that we're working on is that uh, we've got the uh, technical capacity to do so covered uh, with funds from the grant, uh, and so then we explain the process to the cities, and then we, so there, there is the benefits, and then we outline uh, the commitments, basically, and so we kind of talk through the, the next steps. We need a designated contact for the city who's going to help us coordinate meetings and, and, and keep the ball rolling as we move through the process. Um, and we, the city attorneys uh, attended the workshop. Uh, we developed a draft work plan, so we have a timeline work plan, specific uh, items that we're going to achieve on specific dates with each community, uh, and then uh, we're, we request each uh, community formally commit uh, to adopt, uh, to integrate the MIDS into local ordinance. And when I say that, basically that's the short form, right? That's the base. Uh, and then the other components that we're going to look at when uh, we're looking at the short form piece is we're going to look at subdivision ordinances, we're going to look at regulatory programs, uh, we're going to make suggestions on those, uh, starting with city staff. 
uh, and uh, get feedback from city staff. I, uh, and that's, those components are voluntary uh, because uh, uh, each community will kind of decide how they want to run their programs and how they want to de develop it, and we're just in the role of just helping them get there. And so those are kind of that's kind of where we're starting uh, at the uh, the beginning of uh, February here is we're going to be uh, beginning with the red lines of the review and meeting with uh, city staff then to go through those and uh, and start to modify the ordinances and then once we once we have a, a, a draft set of ordinances developed uh, together with the staff, then we're going to take those to the planning commission uh, and council. And we have two approaches uh, for our communities to do this. Uh, this was based on the experience that we had working with the three communities in northern Washington County to develop the uh, the pilot uh, the, the initial mid cap. The first option for the community would be we could do two separate meetings. We could break, break them up into three meetings if we had to to cover the amount of content in the evenings on a typical schedule. Uh, the other thing we could do uh, is uh, buy everybody breakfast on a Saturday morning for two and a half hours and have planning commission and council together uh, with staff, and we'll go through and we'll get uh, we'll go through the entire ordinance package revision within that two and a half hours. The uh, Breakfast is about the only thing that makes ordinance, ordinance revision less painful. Um, so we're hoping that most people take the Saturday morning option, uh, but we'll see. It proved successful in the past. Uh, frequently asked questions, there's a bunch of them. I just uh, threw a couple of them up here. Um, why not just adopt this by reference? We talked about that uh, earlier. The real, uh, I think the real flexibility in this comes uh, if you can have flexibility in your subdivision ordinances. Uh, along with the MIT standards, uh, then you really are talking about making it easier for developers to develop in your community while protecting water quality. Um, does the MIT calculator replace stormwater modeling? The answer is no. Uh, so uh, the really what the MIT calculator does is it, 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 uh, it's an easier form for communities that don't have modeling in place. Uh, the or it can it can complement modeling. One of the benefits of the MIT calculator is it's been approved by the PCA. So if you have an impaired water or a TMDL and uh, you're tracking the projects you're putting on the ground during redevelopment or even voluntary projects, uh, we use the that's how we use the MIT calculator to calculate those loads, and that's what we're uh, that's what we're counting for our load reductions for our TMDL as we're accounting. Um, uh, will this be a barrier to redevelopment? Uh, and that's a big question. We have a lot of areas that uh, are, are uh, getting ready for redevelopment uh, along the river. Uh, again, it goes back to the flexibility. It, uh, it, it, uh, it, in both the, the stormwater requirements and the subdivision ordinances, they go together. Uh, it can actually make it much easier for redevelopment uh, when, if we, have, uh, if we, if we uh, structure those correctly. And so those will be, that'll be a lot of the conversation behind the voluntary uh, work done in the subdivision ordinances. So I, I think I will uh, I will stop there, and then I'll open up if anybody has any questions. Maybe to say a, a little more about the uh, sort of the credits that <clears throat> using the MIT calculator can give a community. So if you have you said if you if a, if a city is dealing with an impaired water or has TMDLs they need to report on, each time a project <clears throat> sort of goes through the MIDS calculator, you sort of take the output of that in terms of the volume reduction, pollutant reduction, and that credits your contribution to the TMDL or the impaired water. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, uh, how, are we, how are we using the MIS calculator to track credits for our TMDL? So uh, in theory, uh, the, the way uh, new development works, uh, new development does not reduce food load. Redevelopment, basically, uh, new development keeps uh, the, the uh, pollutants running off the landscape the same as before it was developed. So no new development will uh, ever give you credit uh, for your um, TMDL. So you're not going to be producing loads there. So we're going to be reducing loads in a watershed. Our redevelopment opportunities, where you have existing uh, loads, uh, fluid loads coming off of impervious surfaces. And so uh, during redevelopment, uh, then what we do is we, uh, during the, uh, the the review and uh, an approval and technical comments portion, uh, we're actually inputting those into the calculator. 
So we have a load and volume reduction, and then we're tracking all of those so we can actually demonstrate in, uh, uh, in quantifiable terms our progress towards achieving our TMDL. Uh, on Lake St. Croix, our, our total maximum daily load uh, phosphorus reduction for the middle St. Croix is around 1,500 pounds a year. Uh, so it's a big number, and it's going to take us a long time to get there, uh, but that's one of the ways we're going to do it. We also use the MIPS calculator now uh, to, um, when we're doing voluntary conservation or voluntary water quality projects or clean water fund grant projects, uh, we run those loop modes, uh, those, those practices and loads through the MIPS calculator as well, and we track those credits uh, through that calculator. So uh, we know exactly what we're going to get credit for for a bioretention cell that has a two-acre watershed, for example. So that's how we're using it. Uh, and it's, um, it's the first time we've actually had uh, verified numbers that the Pollution Control Agency is comfortable with for crediting. So um, it's a, it, was a, it was a big deal for us. Um, do I speak into this little mic here? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So um, uh, I'm one of the new crop of master water stewards that graduated this last year with Peggy Knapp, and so we're um, we're excited about the opportunity in 2016 of additional watersheds and cities being able to have master water stewards being trained that can help then with their MS4 outreach um, to do. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things we would love to see more of is um, the opportunity to target where we're trying, where we're getting out to get neighbors to put in rain gardens and things. And, but it, we don't want to just randomly put out rain gardens. We'd like to do it more strategically. So we're excited to work with uh, Ross and um, Edina where some of the neighborhood outreach is happening on top of some of their subwatershed analysis to then make sure we can put EMPs where it could make a difference. But we are using the MIDS calculator. Everybody has to do a big capstone project uh, where you put in a, you know, a rain garden in the yard and we all of our projects go through the MIDS calculator. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you again for the invitation. I really appreciate your time. or any other material. All right, so that's missed. Um, the next part of our um, workshop this morning will be focused on stormwater reuse. So we have two speakers um, who will be talking about stormwater reuse at the CHS field. And I missed what CHS stands for. Phoenix Harvest State. Huh? What is it? Senex Harvest State. Senex Harvest State. Okay. All right. I've got to change my way of thinking about that because I've been calling it the ballpark for a long time. So that's the combined cost money. That's the company that dropped a bunch of money at the table to name the state the ballpark. <laughs> okay. But it's sure. one of our largest farmers co-ops yeah. in the nation. Sure. And yeah. obviously, <laughs> no one knows what you mean. <laughs> They're a huge, huge cooperative. So. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Wes Saunders Pierce and Dave Stark will be doing this presentation. And Wes is the Water Resource Coordinator for the City of St. Paul. And he holds a Master's Degree in Water Resource Science from the U of M and an Undergrad Degree in Environmental Studies from McAllister. He joined St. Paul in 2011 after practicing water resource management for over a decade, mainly as a consultant. Wes works across departments to provide leadership for green infrastructure, water resource protection, and climate resiliency strategies. Wes's efforts to innovate 
resulted in the city's and Minnesota's first municipal project to harvest rainwater for indoor use at CHS Field. And along with Wes, uh, Dave Stark will be presenting. Dave is the owner of Stark Rainwater Harvesting and uh, an American Rainwater Catchment System Association accredited professional instructor and regional representative based in Duluth, Minnesota. He is an independent installer consultant for rainwater management systems or solutions, excuse me, and works with engineers and architects on residential and commercial systems for multiple end use objectives. Thank you and good morning. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Stormwater reuse is really becoming a significant topic in the field of um, water resource management and water quality. One of the things that it should be called Green Step Cities. I am in the right class today, aren't I? <laughs> That's my Green Step City. <laughs> They have used the same title. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. And I have some things I want to share with you, and then I'm going to invite uh, Dave Stark to come up and talk a little bit about some of the on-the-ground installation um, components of the rainwater harvesting project uh, itself. So one of the things that folks who are not in the room today may not be aware of, but where we're talking is the League of Minnesota Cities building. It's right across from the Green Line. We actually have the Capitol Station kitty corner of this building. And when most people think of the Green Line, uh, at the end of the Green Line in St. Paul, most people think of Union Depot, Union Depot Station. Well, in fact, what's at the end of the Green Line in St. Paul is Net Transit's light rail operation and maintenance facility. And I'm going to talk today about how we harvested rainwater from that building to provide a reuse strategy for St. Paul's new lower town ballpark, CHS Field. And just to get you oriented a little bit, this is an aerial view of downtown of the lower town area. And the OMF that I just referenced is outlined in blue. And just north of that is the property that has been redeveloped for the Lower Town Ballpark. So you can have another view of that, again, an aerial view of downtown. And you can see the rendering and the layout of the new ballpark, um, which is almost complete and ready for the first pitch in 2015. And then just south of that is, again, the Med Transit Light Rail Operation and Maintenance Facility. So talking about rainwater harvesting, most people want to know why. What was really behind the decisions that you made? And here at the Lower Town Ballpark, there are a lot of variables that went into why we chose to pursue rainwater harvesting and also why we were looking at bringing water into the building for indoor use. In particular, in this area, it's redevelopment in a downtown area covered by many, many requirements. We had requirements at the state level through the B3, the Buildings Benchmark and Beyond program. We have water resource requirements from the local watershed district, the Capital Region Watershed District. The city also had its own requirements for stormwater management. Uh, in particular, we have a sustainable building policy that applied to this project. So we had a lot of things going on in terms of the site design. And we knew we really wanted to make sure we went above and beyond all these minimum requirements. So how do we do that in a way that's uh, not only innovative, but also very comprehensive? We also knew that this ballpark was a huge opportunity. This is a destination ballpark for Lower Town and also for St. Paul. And our partner, the St. Paul Saints, were very, very clear that they wanted to make sure they were making a statement with the design for this facility. They wanted it to be as green as possible and stand out in the field of stadium design. There's about 400,000 people that are estimated to come through this facility every year. So we knew not only was it about making this a destination, it was really capturing this audience and really using that audience as a way to help uh, educate and inform about water resource management, water quality, water conservation, just a fantastic opportunity there. 
And then finally, there was actually um, an adopted area plan that talked about water conservation strategies in a very ambitious way. In particular, the Greater Lower Town Master Plan was adopted by our city council about two years, a year or two before the project began. And this was a very ambitious plan that envisioned rainwater harvesting, but also one of the adopted goals was to pursue bringing water into the building for indoor use. So, which gets back to the, the title slide here, can we actually do that? Is it allowed? How do you go through that process? What can you learn from other projects? Where has it been done before? So as we really started out this initiative, we knew there were going to be a lot of challenges about rainwater harvesting, but also to explore the discussion about bringing water into the building for indoor use. And I'm not going to go into all the specifics here. Uh, the Metropolitan Council has a, a, um, a guide that they published a few years ago. Uh, but there is just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of uh, different dynamics going on as we started the conversation. At a very basic level, uh, there is a lot of discussion, and in particular, there's many jurisdictions that need to be engaged in discussion about stormwater reuse and rainwater harvesting. Uh, in particular, at the state level, uh, the plumbing industry, the plumbing code, Minnesota Chapter 4715 provides authority to the Department of Labor and Industry uh, for indoor use of um, water. So that's an agency that we um, had a, uh, a dialogue with. We also have a state agency, the Minnesota Department of Health, which administers public water supplies through state statute, Minnesota Chapter 4720. So at the state level, you have a few agencies that um, have jurisdiction on these, on these types of initiatives. And in looking in the actual language itself, uh, the plumbing code uh, you know, wasn't really written with the anticipation that we would be at our current industry's practice for stormwater management, looking at stormwater reuse, looking at rainwater harvesting. So it's really silent on that topic. However, it does allow for alternative methods. And that was really one of the biggest um, leverage points for us in terms of bringing this discussion not only to our local officials, but also to the other jurisdictions that are involved. And that's just on the indoor uh, use piece of it. We also have the Minnesota Department of Health and the Public Water Supply, which there um, the point of discussion is about water treatment standards. So what is the level of public health risk, whether it's stormwater reuse, whether it's rainwater harvesting, whether it's irrigation, whether it's indoor use, what's the level of public health risk? Also, what's the level of treatment that may or may not need to be applied to uh, the water that you're intending to reuse? So as we really um, started in this discussion, knowing there was a lot of challenges, knowing there was a lot of jurisdictions, we knew we had to have a partnership here. So the city of St. Paul, and the St. Paul Saints uh, were fortunate to have support from the Capital Region Watershed District as well as the Metropolitan Council. Uh, the Watershed District wanted to see um, resources provided to the city for many innovative stormwater management practices. Metropolitan Council were particularly interested in exploring innovative water conservation solutions, but they also had another vested stake in this discussion because of the Metro Transit light rail facility, and they were looking at ways to potentially reduce, reduce the amount of runoff from that property. And then as part of the project team, the St. Paul Saints, uh, St. Paul Parks and Rec Department, and then from the design and construction side, we had uh, uh, many, many wonderful partners involved. We had Ryan Companies as the overall um, contractor, Shadig Mechanical Solution Blue, uh, providing a lot of stormwater management design support, rainwater management solutions, start, start rainwater harvesting. So just a lot of different people that really were engaged to help bring this forward. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but suffice to say there are a lot of milestones, a lot of points during about a year-long process to, uh, to coordinate and move this forward. Now I'm going to talk about some of these items that are circled, some of these design trips that are circled because that's really a key part of what made this a successful initiative. Uh, 
Uh, we started out with a design charrette early in the process to help explore costs and opportunities. Uh, that was facilitated by um, the start rainwater harvesting. So that was a good discussion to get some schematic ideas out and to really test the budget. It still didn't really answer the question of is indoor use allowed? So we had a lot of effort put towards working with our local officials to help address this particular uh, question. And through some fact finding, there are actually examples of, few, of a few other buildings that have brought rainwater into their facility for indoor use. Great River Energy, which is a uh, lean platinum building, and I'll get into this in a little bit more detail, that's in Maple Grove. Uh, the University of Minnesota just completed construction of a new residence hall, and there they were looking at bringing water into the building. Uh, and then, of course, the Lower Town Regional Ballpark, PHS Field, uh, that was one where we were also looking at uh, indoor use, so we were uh, fortunate to leverage some uh, forthcoming code items, and I'll let Dave start to talk about that in a little bit. But just in more detail, Great River Energy, they had a 20,000 gallon cistern that they were utilizing to bring water into the building and to uh, uh, provide uh, flushing for indoor toilets. Uh, the University of Minnesota had a 35,000 gallon cistern, again, also to bring water into the building for, uh, for flushing purposes. So it was really helpful to have these examples, but neither one of these examples really went through a very well vetted process. I'm going to skip this one here. Um, so we did some field trips, we had some outreach, we refined our design. Uh, in particular, what we determined out of a lot of different alternatives was to uh, collect rainwater from the, uh, from the OMF and store it in a cistern behind center field so that we could use that location not only to irrigate uh, some of the ball field, but also to flush a limited number of toilets in the building. So we had another charrette here to kind of go through this final design and kick the tires uh, with the local officials. Uh, again, here's another example of the, uh, the design itself. Well, we're at, um, our project specifies a 27,000 gallon tank. And our estimates are that we're going to be able to reduce about 15 to 20 percent of the ball field uh, demand for water supply, as well as flush about 10 percent of the toilet fixtures in the building. Yeah. Reduce or is 15 percent up? The question of is, is, is the 15 to 20 percent a reduction or is it 15 to 20 percent of the field demand? It's a reduction of the overall demand. So we're reducing the turf irrigation demand by about 15 to 20 percent. And folks that may be familiar with stadium design and uh, uh, similar complexes, ball fields are very, very water intensive, so they have a very high water demand. So although it's 15 to 20 percent, it's actually still a pretty high number from an absolute volume standpoint. I'll get to that in a, in a minute. Try to move through these quickly so we leave time for Dave Stark, and I know there will be some questions afterwards as well. So once we got to a final design, we uh, we convened uh, you know a final vetting and coordination meeting where we had all the state agencies that have been involved in this the discussion. We had the local officials, the funding partners. I mean everybody was there. So the, the Pollution Control Agency was there, the Department of Labor and Industry, the Minnesota Department of Health, and state agencies. We also had watershed districts, Metropolitan Council. We had our building official, our plumbing official. We had pretty much everyone that had skin in the game there. So we, we did that to get, um, in particular, you know, uh, any final comments to really uh, test, if you will, uh, the tolerance for the proposed treatment and the water quality standards and so forth. So I think it was a good model to follow in the absence of a clear path forward for rainwater harvesting. Some of the particulars, uh, just for the people that are more nuts and bolts oriented, I already mentioned the 27,000 gallon tank that is located behind center field. That's actually servicing to harvest water from about uh, three quarters of an acre of the Met Transit's operation and maintenance facility. So we're actually reducing the runoff from uh, almost a quarter of that whole building and bringing that onto the ballpark 
for reuse. So our uh, some of our estimates are showing you know about 450,000 gallons of water that's being uh, conserved, and we're still working through uh, some of the fine tuning on the, on the modeling. Uh, but our estimate is about a 15% reduction in potable water use, which may not sound like a lot at face value, but again, water is a premium commodity at facilities like this, at Arena. So it's a very high demand facility. Uh, so we're roughly taking the equivalent of seven single family residential homes off the water grid forever, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, we did have um, some support from our partner agencies, financial support. Uh, and without that financial support, this project likely wouldn't have been possible. Again, we were able to meet all the baseline stormwater management requirements uh, for the site. So we were looking at additional grant funds to be able to take that next step, to be able to go above and beyond these minimum requirements. And that's what these uh, items here are for. And so all of the enhanced uh, stormwater management was um, almost $500,000 in its total scope, but I think we had some fantastic outcomes from that, one of which is the rainwater harvesting system. Um, and you, know, you can see that this was not only for the actual construction, it was for the design and all the other components that went along with that. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to invite Dave up to talk a little bit more about the actual installation and then also some more of the emerging code issue items. And, um, and here you are, Dave. Thanks, Wes. Uh, I thought I'd just give, um, I know I've got just a few minutes here, but just to describe the relationship between my company, I'm Start Rainwater Harvesting. I'm an independent representative for rainwater management solutions. Um, they're based out of the state of Virginia, so we're the ones who actually delivered the system uh, to the to the ballpark. We're um, when I describe it to my mother, I say that my job is really taking my water resources background and um, being able to work with a wide variety of people to to do this. Uh, we actually went through this process in Duluth, Minnesota, where we did a uh, rainwater uh, system up there as well. It took almost uh, three years to get that system permitted. So I figured with West, we're at a year and a half, so the next one is going to be down to seven months, and we're making progress. <clears throat> Through the work that I've done, uh, we've gotten involved with this organization that I'm going to talk more about, ARCSA. Uh, but that's really where we've learned about code, not only in Minnesota, but really around, uh, around the U.S. So that's who I am. Uh, ballpark installation that's happened. Uh, not too long ago this fall came in. When we did the project, we actually have a, a tank installation crew. Well, we're going to warranty that that tank and the pump skid that comes in. They actually fly in the crew and they erect the system. Um, basically, that's the. Oops. Oh, really pushed the wrong button. Okay. I know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I want to hold the mic up. Um, this is a key portion of any of our rainwater harvesting systems that we put in. We utilize a, a pre-filtration product called a DC filter. Basically a cyclotic filter uh, that removes all the debris uh, down to 280 microns and has a way for uh, the water to basically bypass the system. As we got into code and learning what was going to be required from a mechanical standpoint, the choice of these filters has been key. So basically we talk a lot about this four-step system. We utilize the VC filter and then some other pieces that I've got in the back if anybody would like to see those after the meeting. Um, so basically off of 32,000 square feet, we're going to be coming into this 12-inch uh, pipe at the top, the clean water goes to the tank, the dirty debris falls down to the bottom. And when we're talking in the context of stormwater management, we're always designing for that overflow. So we always think of the rainwater harvesting as the first step in that treatment train. We're working on projects that are uh, living building challenge projects that are doing 100% of their capture for all internal use for residential buildings. Different in commercial, but um, basically that is always the first step. When we look into the code deeper, 
really that um, inclusion of filtration, different ways, how do you put the systems together, that's what's in the current code right now and what's being adopted along with these water quality requirements. So as you can see, we were there at the beginning working on the design shred, really talking about how to put the system together. When we first looked at it, we wanted to come out with full, the full size, the three filters. We had a size at 59,000 gallons. Um, sometimes the budget doesn't allow. We basically came back down and we settled on coming out with 32,000 square feet. Um, then we worked with the mechanical engineer. We basically got a, uh, a pump system here, a filtration system, and a disinfection system that is um, his specifications and that we construct that out of Virginia. And this is the status I believe it is in right now. So it shipped in um, around Christmas and it's awaiting uh, just the final hookups now. Um, there was a lot of discussion just in terms of the controls package that went in. We uh, included what we call the RMS 200, which has the ability to plug into the building. Um, they'll be able to send the data both from a rainwater use standpoint and the municipal use uh, to kiosks for an educational piece. Those can be served up to the internet. And then back at RMS, when we're, when we're actually commissioning the system, they'll come in and they'll look at, um, they'll be able to pull it up on the computers back there if there's ever an issue with the pump. But you can see there's basically the gallons per minute going to the, to the toilet fixtures and then out, out to irrigation. So it's a single, single pump skid, um, variable frequency drive that, that will serve those two end uses. Um, it, the controllers also monitor a number of different things. The pumps, the EV status, um, level sensors, when to switch over to toilets only, and then there are other capabilities in there. As we start designing these more for a stormwater benefit, we can utilize uh, soil moisture uh, sensor probes, raise and dump water out of that cistern so that we can be ready for the next, the next storm that comes along. Basically, in terms of where code issues occur, um, it's typically inside of the building. Uh, when states have not adopted a code within their actual plumbing code, um, you have to go through that alternate methods uh, review process. Um, as we work on more and more of these, this design shred approach is really uh, beneficial because it's usually our stormwater engineers that work with the that they come with the idea, or an architect that comes with the idea that wouldn't it be cool to do rainwater harvest? But when we go back inside of the building, we have to have a mechanical engineer. It's going to be his, it's going to be his stamp that uh, is, is being approved. So it's that ability to work with everybody, and um, that's what we try to do on a daily basis. Um, we have to submit by then basically these treatment standards for whether or not it's uh, gray water, reclaimed water, and rainwater. Um, those have been issues for a while, but we know our systems can basically meet all potable standards. So as a company, both Rainwater Management Solutions and myself decided years ago, when we're coming back into a building, we're going to provide potable water. That's what the National Building Code requires. In Europe, Australia, different places, they don't require that. They can have a dual plumbing system. And sometimes you've seen projects that have gotten away with doing something like that, but really the only difference in our designs is the addition of the ultraviolet light. All of the four steps are the same, the volume is the same. We would have a sediment filter going out for irrigation. We add a UV light, and then we can meet those water quality standards. This is a great paper you know, to come back and reference sometimes. Uh, I think I shared this with Les early on. But it's a, it's a bit dated now. It talks about uh, both the International Plumbing Code, the Universal Plumbing Code, where things were at in 2009. But what it does finds out a really nice process about um, how to go through, how to have this discussion, you know. And I have to say that Wes has just did a fantastic job with this in terms of uh, hurting the cats, getting everybody together around the table, having the discussion. Um, basically starting early, gathering that information, proving it out with water quality, and that's what we do in the background. We've got reports, we've got data, we don't have enough. Um, but, and then also working with NIDS to share some of that knowledge from other states uh, to incorporate it into the Minnesota system. 
So we mentioned ARCSA. Um, it's basically back in 2009, my training as a, as a hydrologist. I worked for an engineering firm coming out of college. Hydrologist houses the guy up in Duluth become a rainwater harvester. There is fantastic training in Minnesota on uh, stormwater benefits, but I, I was looking around like, where do I become a professional rainwater person? And so I met the folks involved with the American Rainwater Association. Um, it really kind of came up about 20 years ago in Texas, people that were running out of water and they were, they were utilizing rainwater for all of their uses. Um, so there it developed into an organization where we actually have an accreditation program. You go through, go through courses, you install five systems. But basically through that process, I, um, it's where I met my partners in the industry. And it was clear that RMS was the one company that was really using science-based uh, and PhDs from the University of Virginia to write models and implement a really scalable system that could be implemented anywhere. In addition to that, a lot of the other rainwater harvesting stuff comes out of very warm climates, and they don't work in 40 below. So all of the BC filters, all the things that we use are stainless steel, and they make it through those, those winters. So I sit on uh, conference calls once a month with people all over the United States. Uh, we can form chapters of ARCSA. We can form a a Minnesota chapter, there are uh, outreach and training opportunities. We can give presentations, and it's really the nuts and bolts of how to put a system together. It goes all the way up uh, and through a design and construction workshop. And I'm hoping that someday that all of that knowledge can be shared with Minnesota and that it can be incorporated, whether it's with uh, the University of Minnesota stormwater program to actually have a training program. because. The education is just uh, so important. And then you see these memorandums of understandings with all these different code bodies. There have been a couple very dedicated people that have worked for uh, upwards of a decade, just starting from design guidelines, what's been done around the world, to get, them, to get the language into the code. And that's really where we're at in Minnesota. We need to get it into the code. Um, we have the international plumbing code, we have the universal plumbing code, and then we have states like Minnesota that have their own state code. Those national codes move faster in terms of adoption, um, and Minnesota is now uh, looking at a portion of the universal plumbing code, so we're making really good progress. Now, I will say, you know, some of the other projects that we worked on up in, up in Duluth, when we ran into these water quality questions, um, I kind of recruited uh, Anita Anderson from the Department of Health, um, was a, a friend and a colleague that I also knew was working on water quality. And she's taken that on as a really large portion of her job now, looking at uh, reused standards, um, not only for rainwater harvesting, but then also for stormwater uh, and also gray water and reclaimed uh, water systems. So I'm, my hope is that in the end we'll get a code that uh, is really, really comprehensive. At the end of the day, this is the web page that you have to watch in terms of the evolution of the code and where it's at. So this is the Department of Labor and Industry. Back in 2010, Brian Soderholm here from uh, Minneapolis started um, the process of trying to get a chapter of, um, on rainwater harvesting into the code. Um, that's a work in progress, and um, I think that we're going to make some some leaps and bounds this year. Local education, I really kind of hit on this already, but one of the, one of the parallels that I, drive, I see is um, um, comparing it to on-site wastewater treatment systems. You've got a state rule from uh, Minnesota, and it's, uh, it's basically taught by the University of Minnesota Extension. Um, and hand it down through there. So there could be a very similar training program for rainwater harvesting. I think I've hit on most of these strategies moving forward. It's basically collaborating, partnering, providing good examples, providing systems that work at the end of the day, um, and then developing some Minnesota-specific guidelines and continuing to work on the MIDS calculator in terms of tank sizing and what the credit is that's applied to the system. 
very important piece. All righty. And if you want to see the cistern, you can go to the ballpark, right? It's not quite installed yet, but if you want to go there, take a look. March. March. Great. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, we have to keep moving. And I'm really sorry because I'm sure you guys have questions about this. If you do, I think Wes and Dave will be around um, when we conclude here so you can ask them questions. So on to another type of reuse. And that is the reuse of stormwater in stormwater ponds. So we've got Sharon Doucette from the city of Woodbury and Brian Baer from the city of Hugo, and they are going to talk about their projects. So Sharon, I don't have your title. I don't know. Sharon's going to introduce herself. There it is. Sharon Doucette, I'm the Environmental Resources Coordinator with the city of Woodbury. I've been there, uh, I think, 12 years and a couple of months. <laughs> it's a long time. Uh, so Anne asked me to talk about some projects um, that we have done in the city and uh, through email communication with her and Phil, I had to admit that they haven't <coughs> as planned and they thought that was actually a valuable thing to talk about. So I will give you some examples <coughs> and tell you how they haven't quite gone the way we expected them to. Uh, so this is a list of the stormwater reuse irrigation projects that we have in the city currently. Um, I'm going to focus on the top three uh, in this presentation, the Eagle Valley Golf Course, the Prestwood Golf Course, and the Linwood Park Irrigation Projects. We also have a reuse system at um, Bielenberg Sports Center that uses uh, a stormwater pond as well as uh, a well on site, an irrigation well on site that dumps into that pond for irrigating all the fields at ESB. Most of it does come from uh, the well there, the irrigation well, because of the massive amount of water we use on the sports fields there. Uh, we do have uh, a private installation at Views at City Walk. It is a small project that serves their volume control requirements on site. Uh, they do use an underground cistern for the storage of water and then an irrigation system out of that cistern there. That was installed in 2013 and, as far as I know, ran very successfully last year. Uh, Bielenberg Gardens is a commercial project uh, in the southern part of the city that is just starting up. Uh, they have uh, a reuse system out of their stormwater pond. The uh, mechanical is installed, the system is in place. They won't be using it uh, probably until this summer. And then there is St. Teresa Woodbury, which is um, a senior living complex that is under construction right now. Their uh, volume management proposal for uh, meeting city requirements was also a reuse system out of their stormwater pond, which will be installed this coming year. Where am I going? Oh, I'm that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jumping far too quickly. Um, so the first two projects that were listed there were the Eagle Valley Golf Course and Prestwood Golf Course. One of the things important to mention here is that Eagle Valley Golf Course is a municipally owned course. Uh, Prestwick is a private course in Woodbury. They are both adjacent to County Road 19. Um, so if you know anything about Woodbury, this is Colby Lake here. Um, Eagle Valley sits across County Road 19 from Colby Lake, uh, and Prestwick is further to the south on the west side of the road. Uh, so in 2013, we did a major road reconstruction working with Washington County on County Road 19, Woodbury Drive. Uh, we went from two lanes to four lanes in this stretch by the golf courses. Uh, we needed to meet the city and the watershed district's um, volume and water quality regulations for the increased impervious surface as part of the road project. Uh, we got South Washington Watershed District, which is the watershed district in the area involved in the project. They wanted to do something innovative and interesting. Um, Colby Lake is impaired, uh, so we were looking at ways to meet the goals of the watershed district to get rid of um, 
to bring Colby Lake into compliance and try to get it off the impaired waters list. So this was actually a joint project between the county, the watershed district, the city, as well as the private golf course Prestwick, who agreed to this review system on their private course. And South Washington did receive grant funding from uh, the Clean Water Fund for the project. But we had modeling that showed reuse at the two adjacent golf courses would fulfill both the requirements for the road project as well as work um, towards achieving Colby Lake's target TMDL uh, total phosphorus reduction. And we were the model shows um, TPE reductions of up to 30 pounds per year through the use of these two systems. So this is a uh, overhead view of the Eagle Valley watershed. Let's see if I can find the pointer without changing it. There we go. Um, so this hatched area was all of the sub-watershed uh, connected to this pond right here on Eagle Valley Golf Course. It's about 430 acres. This is the main location um, for the system set up at the Eagle Valley Golf Course. So there's about 430 acres that drain to that area that we could treat through this reuse system there. And then um, it's just basically a pipe connection under County Road 19 to this pond, uh, and then um, another pipe directly into Colby Lake. So it's very close to uh, the lake. So this was uh, some of the numbers. One of the things we looked at was not only um, <coughs> stormwater and water quality, we were also looking at ways to reduce water consumption with various parts of the North and East Metro groundwater management area. And clearly our golf courses use a lot of water um, during the summer. So the Eagle Valley, the municipal course, irrigates 60 of its total 70 acres. They have about 10 acres in uh, native prairie and um, the rest that they don't know in manicure, and so that area is not irrigated. Uh, they pile up approximately 30 million gallons of irrigation water from their on-site irrigation well. Uh, the proposed conditions would be that same 60 acres would be irrigated. Um, the system was modeled to pump approximately 22.5 million gallons of reuse water from the stormwater pond. Um, significantly decreasing the amount of water that Eagle Valley would need to pull from the aquifer. Um, the other key feature and something that was a selling point, and I'll discuss why this has gotten us into trouble and why the system didn't work as we thought it was going to, um, one of the key features was that we also added a babbling brook feature onto one of the greens um, that was supposed to run your round um, provide kind of a hazard and a visual um, amenity to the course. And um, we thought that both systems could run at the same time. Uh, and that we would just finish, uh, supply the remaining irrigation water from the existing well. So this is a schematic of what we were going to do. And this is installed. I'll talk about what's not working here in just a second. Uh, but this is the large wetlands slash stormwater pond uh, adjacent to County Road 19. There is, uh, the pump is actually within this body of water. Uh, there's a, the transfer station and the controls here to pump the water up the hill into this pond. This is the pond that the golf course uh, currently uses for their irrigation pond. Um, all of their irrigation controls are located at this pond. There is a um, choice at this location. We can either send water into this pond for the reuse system, or we can send water this way. And then through uh, existing stormwater pipe connections through the course, we can send it through these ponds uh, into this large pond here. The babbling brook feature that was constructed on the course occurs here. Uh, and then. Um, the idea was that we wouldn't lose any water. The idea here mm -hmm. <laughs> was that we wouldn't lose any water in this reuse or this babbling brook feature, and that we could basically recirculate. We lose some to uh, evaporation, but we didn't think that it was going to be a significant amount of water loss through that. So that we could continue this loop 
and that most of the water that we were getting out of the pond would actually be able to be used for irrigation. Um, so this was the modeled outcome. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but from a modeling perspective, it was a great project for meeting total phosphorus reduction and uh, volume reduction goals for Colby Lake and for meeting at the TMDL. Um, some of the original difficulties we had specifically at Eagle Valley is that we were installing the very late in the season. Um, so things like the cement slab that the, uh, the pump house was sitting on cracked and then we had to replace it. Um, they had to run the, the line to get the pump out into the water a lot farther than they thought they were going to. Uh, but our biggest challenge to date has been that our Bad Lake Brook surface recirculation feature infiltrates like crazy. From a stormwater perspective, that's great and it's actually doing everything that the stormwater staff wanted it to do. It is doing nothing that the golf course staff wanted it to do. <laughs> Um, so what we had noticed, um, we had lots of water to try this system last year, and it was up and running, and it could have been uh, used for irrigation several times uh, on the course last year, except that there was no water to be used after we sent it through the Battling Brook feature. Uh, this pond right here infiltrates like crazy. So we had plenty of water here. Um, the golf course staff was pumping it, putting it into this system, and it would disappear here. We used up all of the excess water that we had in that pond designed for this system, um, running it through this loop. We actually ran out of water, and the Babbling Brook feature, much to the dismay of the uh, golf course staff, was dry for half the summer because we could no longer pump water out of that pond and put it through the system. Uh, we'd already reached our level of where we said we would turn the system off and let the uh, let this pond refill. Um, so that is an issue. It's a big issue for golf course staff. The babbling brook feature is not an attractive feature without water. <laughs> uh, so the proposed fix, which is occurring um, in the next few months, is we are actually going to line this pond with bentonite, hopefully completely seal the bottom, shut off its infiltration capacity, maybe not exactly what we want for stormwater purposes, but it will make the system function how it was originally designed. Hopefully, we'll continue this loop. We'll still have water left over to actually use uh, irrigating the rest of the golf course. Uh, so the secondary part of this project, um, we did the Eagle Valley Golf Course and the Prestwood Golf Course at the same time. Um, this shows the area from the Prestwick, the watershed is a little bit a uh, smaller area than the Eagle Valley was. It, um, we're maybe reusing the stormwater from approximately this 130 acres in the Prestwick the watershed. Uh, they irrigate 75 acres of their course. They pump approximately 35 million gallons of water. Um, this system, because of its smaller watershed, um, we can get about 17 and a half million gallons out of their pond. Uh, so about half of their needs, the other half would still come from their irrigation well. Uh, the idea here is they also have a few ponds on their site oh my goodness, three minutes. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that have a Um, so they also have a few ponds that run out of water during the summer, and so that's the idea was that this could back up some of those ponds, so they put in some additional pipe networks to refill. So this is the Prestwood Pond. Um, one of the things to point out is this used to be two ponds, and this is where the Prestwood problem lies, um, which is very similar to the Eagle Valley, the one we had infiltration that we didn't expect. Um, this used to be two ponds here. Uh, and when we excavated it, made it into a much larger pond that had a significant more storage capacity for the stormwater coming in uh, for the reuse system. Uh, the, and we bounced the water level of this, uh, of both of the ponds when we joined them together. 
the infiltration is happening along this entire area where we excavated to join the two existing ponds as well as uh, up on the slopes of the pond <coughs> that didn't used to have stormwater bouncing into them that have now stormwater bouncing into them. It seems to be infiltrating out the sides of the ponds there. So the same solution they actually have meant night lines this pond. <coughs> Um, but the aesthetics of that happening at um, Crestwood, which is a very prestigious private course and was very was not okay with them, um, so they were very quick to fix it. Uh, they rock lined the whole uh, new pond area on the perimeter. They bent that line much quicker than we did at Eagle Valley. They needed to address it pretty immediately in their mind. Uh, Winwood, this is a, a city installation in the city park is a 300 acre area. The park does not have irrigation or did not. Um, it's in the Carver Lake drainage area where our swimming beach is. Um, we go back and forth if, if there is um, an impairment on Carver Lake. It most recently was delisted in 2014, but previous to that it was listed um, for a nutrient impairment. Uh, the proposed condition is our parks department doesn't really care about irrigating the fields at this park. It was a project to get rid of stormwater. So they're proposing not to irrigate when there is not water available in the pond. So this shows the area. Uh, the water, the pump is actually in this pond. It is pumped here to where the control system is at our fire station and then pumped across the street to irrigate this uh, six acres of park with two ball fields. The estimated TP load reduction was 56 pounds per year to Carver Lake and 23 and a half acre feet of water used annually. Uh, this project was even more cumbersome. <laughs> the, uh, the contractor we had, uh, this communication, the wrong power was on the original pump control. We had to reorder the entire uh, pump control system. Uh, the, there was not irrigation in the park. We had our irrigation installer go in and there was rocks and garbage and just junk from uh, the residential developments in the surrounding areas that used the park as the dumping ground. So he had a lot of material uh, that he didn't plan on trying to get irrigation lines through that he spent most of the summer trying to get the irrigation line laid in this park. Um, so we didn't quite finish the install by the fall of 2013. So we had parts of the actual pump that needed to go into the pond sitting in our public works yard over the winter and a plow hit it. So we had to order new parts in 2014 um, and the same irrigation installer who was working on this project for us was also working on our Billenberg Sports Center complex. Um, so he was really busy in 14 trying to finish up the work at the new BSC project and couldn't get back to finishing this Windwood project. It was not his priority. It was not the city's priority. Um, so he will be back this spring and hopefully we will have this system up and running. Uh, cautionary notes. I'm not going to go through these. We talked about the regulatory framework already that's been touched on. Um, if stormwater does have contaminants, um, chlorides were a bigger deal than we thought they would be. We did some monitoring of the chloride levels. This is an example. We have done monitoring for 12 to 13 and 14 uh, on these systems, specifically Eagle Valley and Prestwick and on the Windwood system. This shows very high levels of chloride in uh, the Eagle Valley system specifically, I would guess, because it's drainage for 430 acres and because it is taking direct drainage from County Road 19, which is a 50 mile an hour four lane um, kind of super highway for Woodbury. This is where all of the traffic is. The county does um, prioritize it for uh, safety reasons. Uh, cautionary notes, one of the things that surface water is not as certain as other sources. Um, consider increasing the storage capacity and what fluctuating water elevations means to the visual impacts of these ponds. Uh, this is one of the concerns that the two installations we're having privately, uh, the St. Teresa Woodbury and the Dillenburg Gardens area. We've repeatedly said you need to think about the visual impact. You can't, you know, pump this down by four, six feet. That's going to leave you a really ugly pond. 
you need to increase the surface area of the pond and minimize the change in elevation of your pond. Uh, a supplementary water source may be needed. The golf courses still have their backup irrigation wells. St. Therese will have a hookup to um, the municipal supply. Windwood, we're just not going to irrigate when we don't have water available. Um, hire an expert. We have run into a lot of difficulties finding people who have designed these systems in the past, know what the challenges are going to be, know what to think about when it comes to the installation of irrigation systems. Um, there are people who really believe in reuse, but maybe haven't done enough install to be able to take this project all the way to completion. That's it. Learning as we go with these new innovative stormwater management practices. So um, our next speaker, uh, last speaker of the morning, is Brian Baer. And Brian was appointed as the city administrator for the city of Hugo in November of 2011. He came to the city in 2004 and was the city's community, community development director for eight years. He managed all the planning and development activities. Prior to joining the city of Hugo, he worked for the city of Overland Park, Kansas as a senior planner <coughs> in a large, rapidly growing suburb of Kansas City. <clears throat> Excuse me. Brian holds a BA in Geography and Geology from Fitz Davis in St. Peter. Okay, real good. We'll jump right in. Stormwater reuse. We have looked at stormwater reuse in the city of Hugo, I think, more than just about anybody, and uh, we've learned a few things that uh, we'll share with you today. Um, two main reasons that we look at it, one is the water quality reason. Water quality requirements, we try to meet our requirements this way. Water quality requirements, in my mind, these days, the watershed districts and others point us towards volume control to do that. We need to eliminate stormwater, get rid of it, that's how we satisfy our water quality requirements. Any of the other methods uh, don't work uh, because the objectives from the watersheds is to eliminate stormwater. Um, so that's what we do. And then the second one, uh, what it says at the top, reduce, reuse, replenish. These are not requirements. This is a noble goal that our, our Hugo City Council has established. We're going to reduce the amount of water that we pump out of the crown. We're going to reuse water where we can, and we're going to re replenish the groundwater um, as much as possible uh, because aquifer sustainability is an important topic in our area. So Hugo is in the Northeast Metro. We are rapidly growing as it happens, as growth increases in Hugo. The water level in White Bear Lake right here has been dropping. It is a coincidence, but uh, that correlation is there nonetheless. Is there a legal ground? Has legal ground for that? <laughs> uh, here's what I'll tell you about that. We have, this is the regulatory environment that we look at and why this topic is so important to us. The USGS study is completed on White Bear Lake, and that study implicates city wells at least partially as the cause for low water levels. That is an unproven theory. We've been tracking and involved in the lawsuit all the way from the very beginning. There's a lawsuit that has been filed against the DNR for um, allowing the lake to drain, uh, giving cities permits for these wells that drain the lake. There's a settlement agreement in this. There are experts on both sides. This theory is not proven. The DNR um, has established this groundwater management area. The Met Council is doing a whole slug of studies. The effort following the USGS study is to push communities off of groundwater and on to surface water. So um, we, have a, we have appropriation permits from the DNR. We only use right now in Hugo, we only pump 400 million gallons of water from the ground. Sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things it is. Um, we have separate plans for drinking water and stormwater management. Remember the two reasons that we're doing stormwater reuse? They converge when you look at these separate plans. We're looking to combine these two in the documents that communicate with each other. Drinking water plans and stormwater management plans. Should we convert more to surface water? Should we reuse stormwater? Should we conserve? Of course, the answer is yes, yes, yes. 
This is what it looks like. We're at the top of the watershed. Half of Hugo drains to the St. Croix, the other half drains to the Mississippi. Even though we're at the top of the watershed, we have 4 billion gallons of stormwater that leave Hugo every year through runoff. 400 million gallons per year right now as a city. Uh, policy options, I'm not going to go through all of these, but a few of our noble goals at, at the city of Hugo, we want to infiltrate. Can we get rid of the same volume of stormwater that we pump out of the ground from Hugo's wells? So if we pump water out of the ground, can we put water back into the ground? Let's use stormwater for irrigation. Let's develop a capital improvement program. This is done to facilitate the increased use of stormwater instead of city water for irrigation uses. Reduce, reuse, replenish. We have conservation guidelines. Construct a stormwater distribution system. Um, incentive programs for homeowners, water conservation, lots of things that we're doing. Good ideas all around. Um, rev revising our development requirements. We are a very rapidly growing community. Um, a couple of projects. This is the Onika Ridge Golf Course project, similar to what Sharon talked about. Uh, this is a stormwater reuse project on a golf course. It's a joint project in the city of Hugo, the Rice Creek Watershed District, Bowser, and the Onika Ridge Golf Course all partnered on this project. Interesting, remember we have these two reasons we do stormwater reuse. Um, we think aquifer sustainability is a noble cause in the future and will drive a lot of decisions. If you want to get grant money, it is attached to water quality, not aquifer sustainability. So use water quality as a reason for doing these. Um, $600,000 project, all but about $100,000 was paid for through the Clean Water Legacy Fund. Um, it converts a groundwater-based irrigation system to a stormwater-based system. It allows us to reduce groundwater pumping by an average of 32 million gallons annually. It also has a second part of the project, which puts water back into the ground. That's another one of our goals. It has infiltration trenches, and we pump water into these trenches from uh, stormwater ponds. And uh, we can pump up to one, between 100 and 200 million gallons of stormwater into these trenches every year. Active stormwater management. Remember, we only pump 400 million gallons a year. That's up to half of our total water use as the city. We remove phosphorus through this project. That's the reason that we are able to get the grant money that we got to do the project. That's the main thing. Bald Eagle Lake is downstream from the golf course, and it is impaired for phosphorus. Construction has been completed, and it is operational. This is the way that it works. There's a ditch system that comes down from the north, 1,000 acres of, of uh, surface area drain through the golf course. We constructed a stormwater pond right here. And water is collected in that pond and conveyed through a forest main that goes across the golf course and feeds their previously existing irrigation system. Um, when there's enough water in the stormwater pond, and this last summer was a great summer of excess water, we pumped the excess water into this area and uh, conveyed it into the infiltration trenches. It's an excellent area for getting rid of a lot of water, which is what we do right there. So that's basically how it works. <coughs> Here's how we use water in Hugo. Uh, the right half is our domestic and commercial usage. The left half is all irrigation. So about half of our water usage in the city is irrigation. We target those dark blue ones, the irrigation accounts. Those are the big accounts in the city. And we figure if we're going to try to uh, reuse stormwater, let's focus on those. Three locations that we're designing for possible stormwater reuse projects in existing areas. Uh, this is one that serves about 1,100 homes. Um, and they use in that homeowners association, one association for 1,100 homes, they use 44 million gallons of water a year. Similar idea. Ditch system uh, serves stormwater ponds. Those are deep ponds and can serve the entire development. Smaller application in what's called our Beaver Ponds neighborhood. Um, we can reuse stormwater there, also supply water for a park, and uh, replace about 6 million gallons of water per year. Another project, we have a, a la nicely landscaped entrance to the city on, on our county road. And uh, we have a project design that would also 
replace about 5 million gallons of water a year there. So some considerations. How do you do this? How do you retrofit a, a homeowners association? Um, what we've decided is we, you need to treat it like a city utility, like any other utility, like a water system. This is a stormwater delivery system. Capital costs, if we did all three projects, it'll be about $3 million. Likely, this will be paid for by the city. There's also maintenance of these systems. We have to maintain them. It's likely a city responsibility. The city's going to own these systems, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll try to develop a system so that we can sell this stormwater to the homeowners associations. Instead of paying for the city uh, drinking water to water their lawn, they're going to pay the city for stormwater to water their lawn, and then we'd like to recover our capital and O&M costs. Well, how did that turn out? Some cases it turns out that it works, in some cases it doesn't. Um, the smaller projects, it's hard to do this for cheaper than we deliver drinking water. For the bigger projects, it seems like it will likely work. Um, but what if the cost is higher? We charge 265 per 1,000 gallons for our irrigation rate. Well, then it's no deal. Homeowners associations are not going to pay more for stormwater. They'll never agree to something like this. So do we subsidize it? Do we talk to, do we ask our other rate payers to subsidize it? Do we jack up our irrigation rates? And then what about the lost revenue? We collect this revenue and it goes into our water fund, and that water fund loses that money. We've also looked at requiring this in all new development. Bring a separate set of pipes carrying stormwater serving each home. Um, residential is harder than commercial. Single family is harder than multifamily. The size of the development matters. What about the controls? Some of the things that the developers have been talking to us is that the controls are very important. If you have a single family neighborhood, everybody likes that control in their garage. Uh, master controls are difficult to deal with in that situation. And a townhouse development, easier to deal with. What if there isn't a homeowners association? Then what do you do? Uh, health concerns. Well, geez, little Johnny likes to drink out of the garden hose. That doesn't sound good if there's <laughs> stuff in there. <laughs> um, these three projects that we talked about, just in summary, we can reduce pumping by another 50 to 60 million gallons per year. Um, we can also we can reuse that stormwater. We can replenish the aquifer and this uh, 800 pounds of phosphorus. Um, add, adding capacity for future growth, we removed this system from um, our drinking water system, and uh, that adds capacity for a lot of new homes that can be constructed in Hugo. How do we cover the lost revenue? And then there's a series of other cost factors. So in a nutshell, that's what we got. <laughs> Have time for questions? Well, you all might. I have to be somewhere at 11 30. <laughs> 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 the workshop usually ends at 11. If folks are interested in staying and sorry, if folks are interested in staying and asking questions, and if folks on the phone yeah. want to stick around for you know five minutes or so for some questions, that's great. I'm going to be over here taking care of my business. I can get somewhere by 11:30. Yeah. Um, I do want to mention a couple of things, though. I might have to um, leave. Um, I was going to make a request to you all to um, see if somebody could follow me um, on my personal Twitter account that I usually tweet from here, both that and Green Coast Cities, because I was at 999, but I just <laughs> got another person, so I've got 1,000 followers on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I don't need you. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. You're mirrored. <laughs> yeah, that was not clear. No, I told you it was too All right. Um, and, and don't forget to follow Green Step Cities. We have a Twitter account, at Green Step Cities, so find us, and we do the hashtag Green Step Workshop. <laughs> UK SHP. Um, I do want to um, let folks know, especially for cities that have enabled PACE, um, properties of clean energy in their communities, um, I am um, organizing an event with a focused audience of cities and businesses to make sure that those, those parties know about PACE financing for energy efficiency and clean energy projects. Uh, it's going to be uh, February 12th in the morning at the Town and Country Club. Um, the St. Paul Area Chamber is co-sponsoring, Ferry Plains, the White Bear, Business, White Bear Avenue Business Association, Excel Energy, and the St. Paul Port Authority. And really, especially in Ross, I'm going to give you a handful of these cards that you can share with your businesses. But we really want to get businesses there so they can learn about some projects. Um, and it is also the topic 
for the Green Subsidy Workshop next month, uh, February 18th, will be engaging your businesses and your um, commercial sector in that, you know, kind of game of reducing greenhouse gases and energy um, in their businesses to save them money. Um, and there's some great, um, great tools out there. There's some great examples out there. We'll have, I think, Maplewood and Oakdale here um, to talk about some of the things that really innovative things they're doing, including a green lease addendum and some um, green building incentives. So um, they don't, you don't have to use a stick. You can use a carrot, but you can use a stick if you want. It's up to you. Um, so thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Anna and let her um, do the question and answer. Thank you. Um, you will get a survey and uh, an email and email. So please fill that out. We will also put together a blog and send that out that will include the PowerPoint. Um, so you will have access. Thanks, everyone. All right, let's, let's take a little time for questions. You know, as, as we were planning this, as Bill and I were putting this workshop together, I, I think we were a little ambitious. <laughs> um, I think we may have tried to cram in too much, but there's just so many cool things going on. I mean, we could have done two hours just on uh, Lower Town Ballpark and, you know, two hours on pond reuse. And I'm, I'm sorry if we went through it too quickly, um, but I think if we could just take 15 minutes or so, if that's okay with you guys. If you have to leave and go somewhere else, that's perfectly fine. But for those of you who want to stick around, if the speakers are okay with sticking around for 15, 20 minutes, let's have some question uh, discussion on uh, the presentation itself. Well, I'm just, Brian, I'm just dying to know, n number one, the microphone. oh, right. Um, I'm dying to know, so does, does Hugo? It's a power button, not a walk button. All right, let's see. Uh, you can repeat. Oh, no. so, so, so does, uh, you can repeat. So does Hugo require uh, development to have a homeowner, do you require a homeowner association? And how do how did you answer the sort of sub cross-subsidy question in terms of size of development and rates? Well, some of this, uh, the question is, uh, do we require homeowners associations? And then how did we handle the subsidy question? And uh, the first question on do we require homeowners associations, sometimes we do. So a homeowners association is required when there is some common space that needs to be maintained or there's some um, reason for it to exist. Townhome associations always have homeowners associations. That would be a requirement. A, a standard single family subdivision is not typically required to have a, a homeowners association, some, although some do. So. City doesn't always require it, and it's a stretch to require it in a circumstance like this. Um, the second question about the city subsidy, that's a question that we've been confronted with, and we haven't figured it out yet. And so um, we would rather not subsidize it. We would rather figure out a way where this works, and we're looking to see if we can lower the cost in some of these areas so that we don't have to subsidize it. But to do it right with the lessons we learned from our golf course project, um, that's a discussion, an uncomfortable discussion that our council will have to have. Okay. Um, I just first wanted to say, very Terry Gibbs, the Alliance for Sustainability in St. Louis Park. I first wanted to say thank you to everybody with Green Step Cities for this forum and and particularly to you for organizing it and each of the speakers. I have to tell you, I just learned a huge amount. I wish I could bring you all to St. Louis Park and have you share directly. So I'll try to share as much as I can um, from this. But I think it was just really important and really excellent. So thank you so much for doing it. I have a whole host of questions, but I'll just start with one. Um, I was just curious about the difference between the, uh, the, the quality of the water from the rooftop before and then after going through your system, how what, what kind of quality is there? Well, the answer to it is really that it varies. I mean, it varies geographically. It varies by the in the roof type that you've got. In this particular, um, I was just curious. Um, so we haven't done any pre or post monitoring. Uh, the products that we use uh, basically are re removing um, organic matter. So everything, everything that's in, in the water, that uh, really removing that, um, the reason that we use them is that 
then you do not have to maintain that tank. That's the bottom line. If you don't have the organic matter inside of the tank, you don't have it decomposing, uh, your bacterial counts in that tank are going to be um, such that um, it becomes very easy to pump and treat the water. So that's why, you know, as we're a rainwater harvesting company for a stormwater management practice, that's why we preferentially go to go to the to the roof water and applications like uh, up on the golf course. I mean, we're talking huge volumes, right. um, but there have been projects where we've uh, more of my partners have come in. I mean, up, upwards of six million gallon systems. So it's basically the reason that we do the four things: to keep the water clean, then it's easy to pump the trees. Thanks. And, and just to follow that up, I'm just curious about um, atmospheric deposition on a rooftop. So let's say we get rid of the organic matter. What do you think the quality of that water is in terms of potability? Uh, you know, could we, if we were doing more, my sort of question is, if we did more rooftop harvesting, could we really use that water safely, got rid of the organic, without all of the expensive treatment aspects? I'm just curious what you would think. The water quality in the tank is, um, in, in Europe, in different applications, is basically uh, at a level where they're, they're allowing it to go inside of a home to do non-potable applications and separate things. So somewhere out there, somewhere in these other states, someone has done enough of a health risk assessment to say, that um, that water quality is not going to pose a huge threat. Um, it's really more when we come back into the building, we feel like we have, we have the opportunity to provide whatever water. We don't call it reuse. We call it use. Um, you put a pump in a lake, and well, you pump it, you use it. So we know that you know we've got that water quality. One of the issues is as EPA has not handed down these non-potable water quality regulations, both for indoor and outdoor yeah. uses. Each one of the individual states has had to go like, where do we get this information from? <clears throat> so through my partners at RMS and this nonprofit that we work with, I mean, we know what all the issues are. We also have data that we can back up our systems. And we want people to test them. So we're inviting the Department of Health come in, test our systems. Um, but then for outdoor use, I mean, we do systems where we're just going right straight off the pump uh, through a sediment filter. We don't feel like that health risk is that high, but they'll have to they'll have to work through that. Um, but we can. We, I drink it every day. Right. It's in my system. Interesting. Interesting. Did you have another question? Yeah, but I'll play. Okay, Ross, you have a. I'll use that. I'm just curious. Uh, whether uh, Woodbury or Hugo had, you know, the you know dollar per acre foot, or I saw a little bit of that in Brian's presentation. But you know, what kind of scale? How many acres or how many uh, acre feet or million gallons a year do you have to get to before you can start to be competitive with the water utility? We have done a lot of those calculations and I don't have the numbers right here right now but I can tell you that the, the bigger projects you know serving 1100 homes it, it looks to us like it can work um, it's a complex system to try to retrofit with all the imagine all the irrigation zones for 1100 units and the little landscape sprayers that pop up out of the ground and stuff um, complicated system but it, it's much more efficient the smaller system, in the uh, Beaver Ponds neighborhood, only six million gallons. It's uh, it's, it's been a lot harder for us to figure out how to design that system. The, the where all the cost is is with the pumps. Yeah. You know, you're basically building a lift station, right? and that's what's expensive. And so once you get beyond the cost of the pumps, it starts to it starts to you know uh, help if you add more homes to it. You can add the piping and uh, and so forth. So we've got we've got the numbers, but you know, the cost per acre foot and, and even cost per pound of phosphorus. We've got all of that information. I just not the uh, expert in that area. Do you have a follow up? Uh, the one thing I would say in response to that, Ross, is you know, when we have looked at these systems, one of the things we look at is um, from the water quality perspective and the stormwater management perspective and comparing the cost to trying to find locations 
for installations of rain gardens or other infiltration EMPs. And from that perspective, from a water quality perspective, they're cheap. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that the failure on the Woodbury systems where you had to line the ponds, uh, you know, it's a failure from one perspective where you were trying to do a beneficial use on the irrigation side, but you might not have even had to hook up to an irrigation system if that was the original plan is to use the natural environment <coughs> to find places to soak in the water and promote that infiltration. Uh, I think there's, there's, there ought to be more study or attempts to do those regional infiltration systems where you're using nearby water storage. That way you also don't have to struggle with the application of or the salt causing damage to the turfs. And then, you know, in 50 years you have to replace your entire golf course topsoil profile because it's been chock full of sodium. I was just curious if there's a difference in the pumping cost between where they would be pumping. Um, you know, how much energy that takes, probably for a higher lift than yours need to. Do you know anything about that? Is there any? I mean, your point is really excellent, I think, about what would be the alternative cost, but I think that's what we got to really look at. But I, is there a difference in pumping charges, do you think? We, look, we did look at that. This is the, in Hugo, it's a private golf course. Yeah. And the golf course owners were um, not involved financially in this. And they wanted to make sure that there wasn't a financial impact to them. There's some benefits to the golf course, um, but they didn't want to pay for extra electricity. Um, they were pumping uh, water out of the ground, and now they're pumping it this way. And uh, we didn't really see it as a significant difference in electricity costs one way, one way or the other. Another question has to do with um, with uh, both Woodbury and Hugo having a lot of turf grass and being in that area for the northeast suburbs with uh, fishing with Biker Lake, um, one one strategy with the Master Water Stewards is we're encouraging people to throw out fescue grass seeds onto their lawn and over like three or four years you can kind of reseed your lawn in the direction of being more drought tolerant. Um, is, is that a potential strategy of how to gradually shift turf grass to more drought tolerant, um, especially for yards and things? That, that could be. It hasn't been our focus. Um, our focus so far has been on these, these big projects where we can make the biggest difference. And then through our landscaping ordinances and our development review processes, the, the big thing that we're working on now that we didn't used to do is we're looking at the amount of turf in a project. You go through the developments and you see all this green lawn and you think, why Why do you need all of that? Mm -hmm. And so eliminating a lot of that and, and just replacing that with, uh, you know, just bring the wetland to edge in a little farther or something like that. And a lot of these unused green spaces, we've even talked to homeowners associations about just um, uh, redefining that edge and moving their mower in and moving their sprinkler heads in. And, and all of that, and so that's been our focus is, you know, along those lines, but not necessarily um, asking them to reseed. And I think I would agree in Woodbury right now, our, our main priority is focusing on the existing irrigation users and making sure that we are getting them to understand how their irrigation system works and how um, they can probably reduce their own water costs and save a lot of our groundwater by actually figuring out how their irrigation system works. And that's been our focus is the existing irrigation. Um, the city code and ordinances are set up to allow native landscaping um, anywhere that you want them. Uh, it's more of an education effort in the future to get out and try to promote them in, in new development areas. One of the other things that was brought up is the issue of salt infiltration and um, in, in infiltrating water down into the aquifers. Um, we have so much wood salt in the Twin Cities, and I'm just wondering about the long-term impact on the Prairie du Chien aquifer of all this growth salt. And is anybody tracking whether our underground aquifers are gradually getting contaminated by salt, and or how to deal with that problem? 
I, I don't know that I can answer that, but what I can say is that uh, I don't think there's been any real look, serious look at groundwater recharge in the metro. The Metropolitan Council right now is doing a study in our area that is starting to look at the relationship of how much water actually can recharge into the aquifer. So that might be the first question. What sort of exchange is there in the first place? And we don't even know that answer yet, much less to even start to think about what kind of nasty stuff are, is percolating in with that water. So we don't even know the first part of that question yet. But that is, you know, and to your question earlier, which is um, the projects are more efficient. You look at the golf course and think of all the water we can dump into the ground through this active infiltration system. I mean, it, we look at all these different systems and these passive systems, rain gardens and things like that. They don't do very much. But these active systems, holy cow, we can pump water into them all day long, all night long. Way more than irrigation. Why bother with the irrigation? Well, the reason you bother with the irrigation is because of the second factor, this aquifer sustainability question is becoming maybe as important or more important than the water quality component that everybody's been focusing on so far. So and having that, that uh, reduced demand on the aquifer is, is uh, as important. I would just follow that up with, I don't, I don't think that we're focusing on the groundwater impacts of our road salt uses, but at least um, from the surface water perspective, the PCA has been working on the metro wide chloride TMDL, um, you know, and there's a lot of education practices out there for municipal staff. I think the city of Woodbury has done a, an amazing job. We've grown leaps and bounds in our salt technology, and we've really taken that to heart. Um, we're saving money at the municipal level and what we put on the streets, um, and we're protecting our surface water resources and our groundwater resources as a result of that. I, I just had a question uh, regarding the, the permitting of the systems. I mean, in terms of, of um, kind of the focus of what we were talking about, meeting end use water quality requirements and the, and the health risk, have you been immune to that because you've been outside of the jurisdiction of the Department of Labor and Industry, or um, are, they are they monitored systems? You know, there wasn't a lot of permitting hurdles that we had to go through um, with our projects. We have, uh, um, there was some question about the, the valves and things like that, or, so that when, uh, from the Department of Health, um, if, the, if these ponds dry up, the golf course is going to convert back to a groundwater source, and you know it's important how that connection is made. But the the health part of it is something that the golf course um, was more internally wanting to focus on versus any regulation um, through health or plumbing codes for the outdoor use. Uh, one of the challenges that we had is knowing who to call and who to ask questions of. <laughs> Um, I think one of the issues that we have had um, in these, you know, solely outside of building um, reuse systems is some of the water that we're drawing from our natural wetlands. Uh, one of them, I believe, is the DNR Public Waters Wetlands, so uh, they were involved and they wanted to make sure that we weren't drawing too much water out of the system uh, and, you know, being a detriment to the wetlands. Uh, one of the one of, Yes, uh, the water appropriations permit question, um, you know, whether we had to uh, get to pay for appropriations out of all of these surface waters, that was their initial stance, is that we did, we would need an appropriations permit for all of these. Um, there, our biggest concern, I think, came from one of the installations I didn't mention um, that was first in the city, and that was at the Washington County Environmental Center. Uh, they took uh, roof water uh, and stored it in a cistern inside of their building and so then it tripped all of the, and I think they were just using it exterior to the building after that for their irrigation, but because their cistern was inside and it was taking roof water and they broke the building envelope, they had to deal with all of the plumbing codes and they were not complimentary of that process and getting that project through. 
and I think that was our concern is, you know, who was going to get involved and who did we have to talk to, what permits were needed, were we doing it the right way, and, you know, it, the process just wasn't clear at the time for any of our projects. Dollars. <laughs> that, that, that's really what we've had to go through. I mean, some of these little projects that we did for St. Louis County up in up in Missouri, that was it. And frankly, I was naive going in, you know, designing a system and uh, thinking that we're just going to go, we're going to go out and do, do irrigation. Why is there an issue? But that's where you know we come back and and instead of you know kind of the knee jerk response I hear around this, I well, I can't do it. It's not in code. It's because of the fund code. The reality is, you know, that that system is going to form in time. And, um, you know, even talking about the ballpark, can we been in even earlier in the in the pre-development and site development plan, we would have looked at things in a completely different manner. Um, the first 59,000 gallon system, which would have met a lot more of our demand, uh, we actually had it so that, you know, when we're going outside, we're not doing the disinfection. So if you have tanks outside, that's one of my big, that's the big outstanding uh, jurisdiction question. You've got a big 100,000-gallon uh, plus cistern in the ground, and you're just going to outdoor irrigation. Is that covered under plumbing code? But I think if they could just get that piece figured out, then we can make the split because our systems don't change. Then when we come back in, we disinfect. And the reason that we're doing that is, you know, for the volume control, and instead of just going to reuse, because we know we're at that higher water quality. It opens up all of these other opportunities for you as soon as the, as soon as the uh, rules come into place. You guys, I think we have to cut it off here. I know there's, if, I think, you know, you can stay afterwards, but I need to get the work doing, so I need to keep going too. I just wanted to thank our sponsors again, Solution Blue and Start Rainwater Harvesting, and I can tell Energy for sponsoring this event. And thank you so much to all the speakers and for your great questions. And, well, can, can 